contribute without having reviewed uh, the note well and all the documents it points to. In addition, please treat everyone with respect. We have no problem with you attacking their ideas, but please don't attack the person delivering them. And uh, we have a very long agenda. We obviously will not get through it today. Hopefully we will get through everything on this slide. <laughs> so the, the um, uh, agenda has been posted and updated like three times uh, just today. <laughs> and um, the uh, big things have been uh, being adjusted. One of which is um, of the four documents that became RFCs uh, since we were last together, Three of them were published last night. <laughs> so congratulations to the authors and other contributors of those documents. Thank you. And congratulations. The um, other two, uh, we, we have mostly finished in this working group. Uh, they're gone to the ISG, um, one of which has an issue that's been raised. And so we'll be talking about that first. The other one, the um, NF EKU document, it has no open issues that we're aware of. Does anyone in the room know of any open issues with that document? Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. Then there's a group of documents that all have to do with updating PKIS, PKICS specifications. Then we have a special topic. Uh, last Friday, we had an attack uh, against the use of uh, AES CBCM and AES GCM uh, posted that uh, basically only works because we also support CBC. And um, the cryptographers who found that are coming and will be presenting first on Wednesday. And then um, I have a proposal for how to fix it. Uh, so I'll present after them. Then we have a group of SMIME documents. If the uh, PKIX documents don't take the whole hour, we'll move into these. And then we have a group of documents that people would like to talk about us adopting. Um, and that doesn't include the one that just got sent to us in the last session. <laughs> the... Um, and then there's one that uh, would the, the authors hope they can present for information. So um, very full agenda for three hours. Uh, so I think, John, we're going to start with the ChemRI document, unless there's any agenda bashes. Really, I can hear it really loud. <laughs> OK. So yeah, I'm going to talk about the uh, Chem RI document. As Russ mentioned, it's currently in the IESG the state. Anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Again, it's the key encapsulation mechanism in cryptographic message syntax. So you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so it, it essentially uses the Chem algorithm to um, to to be able to derive a key that's used then to encrypt the content encryption key. Um, we've explained this before, it's, uh, you've all looked at it, it's, so you can go to the next slide, I don't think we need to spend time here. Um, so as I was just saying, it's an ISG state. I actually looked at the RFC today to find out what those states mean. So anyway, it's part of the, the whole process and there's a very, very long, so it's one of the states, I think it's like eight or ninth out of like 20. So anyway, so we're waiting for AD, go ahead, external party. Um, there's a number of issues discussed on the list, we believe they've all been resolved, except for one which Russ was just mentioning that Falco um, and Johannes uh, mentioned about the inverse CBC decryption oracle attack. And as he said, they will be, I guess, talking about it on Wednesday. So I won't go into the details of that. Uh, they had asked us if we could uh, put a new um, information in the CMS ORI for CHEM, other infrastructure, basically putting the, uh, I think, the, the content encryption algorithm there. They said that would mitigate it. But obviously, it's a, an issue that would affect all of CMS. So, a solution that you know applies to everything would be better. And I believe 
Russ actually came to our hackathon on Sunday and said he had written some code and was looking at mitigation. So I guess he's going to be talking about that. So, so we'll be hearing about that, I guess, on Wednesday. So that's essentially where we are. Any questions on that? Oh, Mike, I guess you had something. Hi, Mike Ellsworth, and trust. Um, I sort of feel like this is maybe moving slightly too fast. Like maybe it hasn't had enough soaking time for review. Um, one, and I'm guilty on that, but here's a comment that I probably should have made six months ago. Russ, can you explain why this is not using HPKE? And is that going to cause interop problems oh. with other things that think it should be, <laughs> and that CMS should have HPKE and blah, blah, blah. Yes, I can. And you won't like the answer probably, but I can explain it. So I worked with a couple folks to work on an HPKE for Jose and Jose document. And what we found in that environment is that binding the um, uh, key agreement, the key uh, establishment using as vague a term as I can on purpose with the use of an AEAD is what HPKE defines, right? And CMS, Cose, and Joey, Goze all split those into key management and then encryption or AED encryption or authentication. And that splitting is, is inherent to the way that all three of those protocols work. And when you try to mash it together in Cose, uh, especially trying to use the code points from the CFRG HPKE um, registry, because they one code point defines both how to do key management and how to do the uh, AEAD. You just, the protocol and that library, especially the HPKE libraries for those who had them, did not jive. And so really it's do HPKE or do CMS, Cose or Jose. And they're still fighting on that draft two years later. And I took my name off it. <laughs> I hope that explained it. And it certainly has nothing to do with MRI. <laughs> so that sort of also answers my next question, which is CMS will never do HPK. That's correct. <laughs> good. We got it. Except for Mike. That's always good. I guess Roman had something. Hi, Roman Danilio, uh, AD. Just as a process observation, is it ready for RFC editor? We're a lot of steps away from that. We haven't even gone to ITF last call. So I don't mean I got a wordsmith your title, but the next step is I have the document. I've done AD review. We've cleared what I, uh, my, my kind of concerns. We got the new stuff going back. I don't know how big the changes that will be required. Maybe it'll have to go back to the working group. Uh, and then at some point, it'll, it'll ITF last call, ISG review, and after that, it'll go to RFC editor. So, I thought it. I thought okay. it, I thought it finished last call. It, yeah, it's it's uh -uh. I, I think you finished slide. last call, then you put it in external party. Yeah. Your previous slide has the exact same. <laughs> but, yeah. Your, your point is right, though. There's plenty of time to fix that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so plenty of time to fix. Yep. Right. Am I right? You are. You are. Good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any, anything else? Yeah, Roman, you're still in the queue. <laughs> All right. Okay. Great. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, what's next on the agenda? Okay. So we're going to talk about CMP BIS next. Why are they not in the order I put them in the? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but they're, it's not in the preloaded stuff for some reason. There it is. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so these two drafts are from um, 
requirement from the ADs, the ISG, to incorporate the yeah. stuff. Blame you. Blame you. No, not the. Yeah. But you're the messenger. They, they, <laughs> they asked us to incorporate the stuff from RFC 9480 into the original drafts and not provide this Delta document because it's too complex to read. So we did that. So the 67.12 bis is stable. We need to align it with a published RFC. And the 42.10 bis is, there are still some to-dos open and maybe next slide, please. Uh, that was a status on 67.12 bis. Um, next slide, please. So 42.10 bis. Um, we, we would like to get some more review onto the CAM integration into the CMP document. I think we discussed that in IETF 116. I spotted this nice comment from Russ in the minutes. <laughs> um, so anyone from the working group um, has time and bandwidth to review that is welcome. Specifically after this discussion on CMS CAMRI, I would like to get feedback on the content we have for the CAM other info for the context. Uh, we put quite a lot of context into that. Maybe it's too much. Maybe we can get along with less, but I would like to see feedback and, and opinions on that. Makes complete sense after the talk on Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So next slide, please. Just um, to, to recap what I presented at ITF uh, 117, um, we introduced um, algorithm identifier. We introduced an, um, a general message type and we introduced this uh, CAM other info for the context uh, separation, and then we used the established key for MAC-based protection. Can you step closer to the microphone? Oh, sorry. Is this better? Oh, yes. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so next slide, please. So this introduces then how these structures are used. So in general, if you expect a client having a CAM a key pair, we need first a general message exchange to give the server the opportunity to provide the client with a fresh um, cipher text. Then the client can derive a session key and provide a Mac-based protection, which then the server can validate. And the server is free to use whatever protection um, suits its credentials and uh, the client can reuse the Mac key for further message protections of that transaction, if there are them. Next slide, please. The other situation where the server has a CAM key, probably that's not the most um, common situation, but if it is, then the client could directly provide the ciphertext in its request message if it possesses already an authenticate, authentic um, public CAM key of the server. Elsewise, it, it also needs this um, additional general message round trip, and uh, then it, it works uh, similarly. In case both client and server has CAM keys, this can also be um, easily um, combined. In, in the same messages. Okay, so any questions? Okay. Thank you. So thank you. Which one? He, I thought he said so. Uh, the PKS, PKCS 12 PB Mac. I'm here, I could have, uh, oh, nice. but like, I don't know if, uh, uh, if there's anything to discuss. Okay, let's find out. This, this document is in working group last call. So um, if there are any open issues, please raise them now. Yeah. 
far as I know, uh, only David uh, um, has raised problems with uh, PBMAC, uh, no, uh, with uh, uh, BMP string encoding for the password, but uh, I've just merged that pull request that, uh, uh, that addresses that. So I think that's basically everything. Uh, just need to push the new version to the uh, editor. Hey, it's Sean Turner. Um, so I think I did send a message about this. This is on the right draft. I might be talking about the wrong one, but an ASN1 module. Do you remember? Maybe it's a different draft, but I thought I sent, a, I, so I thought I sent an email requesting one. I, I thought I replied to it, said you're wrong. I, that's what I was trying to figure out. I'm not, <laughs> quite, I'm not quite clear how somebody who's got, whether people use modules or not, compile yeah. the things and they actually are able to select this algorithm. So I think there's like one minor extension like dot, 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 it needs to be added in one uh, field. We'll have right? to check, but I don't so, think so. Okay, so we'll double check, but that's the only thing that I'm wondering. Thanks. Okay. And I say that because I need this thing, so. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sean. All right, so let, let's just have, uh, as part of the last call, check the ASN one, and then uh, th this document should be done. Uh, CSR uh, yes, Mike. Michael. <laughs> Oh, that's CSR attestation. That's the one. Michael Richardson, yes. <laughs> I don't have slides from him. Okay. All right, then I the certificates. I did not get slides on the lithium certificates. Is there anything to say? Uh, obviously, we're still waiting for NIST to assign OIDs. Okay. Same for Kyber certs, as far as I know. Oh, you have slides? I didn't get them. I even used the tool. That means I have to go to my mail to find them. Sorry. <laughs> From Sean. No, that'll be. I did use the tool. Because these chairs have to say yes. Well, yes, but. How do you know which data points are the I didn't get them, Sean. <clears throat> okay, we can do it later. Start finding from up the office. Which one? Um, Ali. Who, Ali. Ali's going to talk about this. It's one slide. Where the heck is it? <laughs> there it is. No, not those. <laughs> we'll get the right slide. <laughs> yes, that slide. Cool. It's short either way. Um, so did, we're in working group last call. There's just a few um, like light nits, um, updating the ASN.1 module, which is probably the most exciting one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and <laughs> then, Sorry. then there were a few other um, really like nice suggestions that we just didn't really get strong opinions on, probably because there's not much to say either way. So um, the signature field, it was suggested to add an optional field to specify the hash instead of using the same one that we used to sign the cert. Um, I don't have a strong opinion either way on that. Um, and then the other one was just to use GMT instead of binary time, which is also, I think, not a very controversial decision. <laughs> so if anyone has strong feelings either way, um, we can chat now or on list or whatever works. Cool. Okay, thanks. David Benjamin, policy graph. Is David in the room? Yep. 
Did he send slides? David Benjamin, I have only one sentence, so there's not much of slides. Uh, the document was adopted, and I don't think I've made any changes since it was adopted. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this is the policy graph document is ready for last call. Although people have other comments, I'm happy to uh, include them. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. Anybody uh, have concerns with uh, with proceeding to last call on that document? Okay, with note taker, there's an action item. Thank you, <laughs> please <laughs> proceed to last call for that one. There's gotta be a better way to deal with these when there's this many slide decks. <laughs> yeah, Mike, CSR at your SS station. Okay. Mike likes purple. <laughs> Mike's <laughs> company likes purple. Like, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, so this is work that we've presented. Uh, I think this is only its second IETF, but it's moving quite quickly. So we've been running a design group, um, I guess, semi-formally under LAMPS since April. And this, this document is the first output. We also have a similar one in RATS. Um, so I'm presenting something similar at RATS. Um, yeah, it's, next slide. So the, the goal here is attestations. Um, and if Hank's in the room, I'm going to use the word attestation to mean either evidence or endorsements. <laughs> um, and, and we're starting to see this technology pick up, right? You've got TPMs that can do it. You've got... Um, YubiKey type things and Android type things. And there's starting to be a wide ecosystem of, of attestation type things. We are starting to need this to be transmittable to CAs. You're requesting a certificate from a CA. The CA wants proof that the private key is in hardware. Um, and so we're starting to need this to be integrated into PKI. In particular, there's some time pressure here because Cab Forum made a rule that went into effect like already, like last summer. Thanks. <laughs> Cab forum that um, for code that signing certs, exactly. if you're if you're requesting like a Windows code signing cert, you have to prove to the CA that you're storing the key in a FIPS or Common Criteria certified module. But there isn't any good really automation for proving that to the CA, so it's all a bit very manual and horrible. So this is part of a step towards being able to automate all of that ecosystem. And so what we're doing here in this draft is we're saying if you have an attestation in any format whatsoever. Here's how you carry it in a CSR. Next. So I'm going to walk through diffs from, from the last time we presented this. So uh, these are diffs from the pre-adoption, so the draft Ellsworth OO, which then became a draft IETF LAMPS OO, and then a draft IETF LAMPS 01. So I'm diffing sort of two versions back with a different name. Um, so here was the original ASN one we had for these attributes. Uh, we had a lengthy, long debate about this being awkward. So this was basically we had an, 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 an you could have one or more attest statements and then zero or one like counts max one certificate bag. And the idea there was you know provide as many endorsements or evidences as you want and then provide a big massive unordered bag of certificates that you'll need to verify them and this sort of got unwieldy we we as as, as we imagine the technology growing and getting better used and that maybe you'll have two or three or four or more um, evidence and endorsement statements in a csr the number of certificates that you would need to verify them might grow in some unwieldy way and yes, in theory, certificate path builders should be able to path build over some random unordered bag. But in practice, we know that that's not always how certificate clients work. And that sometimes they get really pissy if the one they want isn't first in the bag and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, so this got, this got reworked. And in particular, there's another problem that if multiple evidence endorsement statements each come with their own certificate chain, which may be overlapping, then whichever device is constructing the endorsement or constructing the CSR will need to merge them and deduplicate them, 
which sounds really annoying, especially if that device is a small firmware thing that doesn't want to have, you know, robustness to be able to merge and deduplicate search chains. So this, this sort of method mechanism got a bit messy. So uh, next slide. Carl Wallace just sort of airdropped us our solution. Thank you, Carl. Um, and he proposed that we change the structure to an evidence bundle. And an evidence bundle is a sequence of evidence statements and optionally a, a, a cert bag, sequence of certificates. And then you can have multiple of these. So basically that means if you have multiple evidences that share a cert chain or share a overlapping cert chain or somehow logically share certs, however you want to do that, you can group things. Or if you want to have a one-to-one -one mapping between evidence statements and cert chains, you can just submit multiple of these. So you can do the one-to-one, -one, you can do the one-to-many. This sort of seems to solve all the problems. Um, that's what that says here. Yeah, identical overlapping search chains can be grouped. Registration with different search chains can be separated to help the verifier and allow easier construction of these compound attestations that need to merge and to duplicate. Uh, Mike, Mike St. John's, are you here? He's in Prague. I know he's in Prague. <laughs> but he's not in this room. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, call out to MSJ. I know you on the mailing list, you didn't like this merging. And I'm curious. Yeah, I, I need to discuss that more fully with, with Mike St. John's to, to understand. Because I think you were talking about cases where there's partial cert chain overlap. But maybe the, like, the signing cert is different. But otherwise, the two chains overlap. And I, I think that probably should work fine with this. But if, that, if this you know, critically fails with that use case, I'd like to understand that. Otherwise, we think this handles all use cases. Next. Uh, next change. Thank you, Hendrik, for pointing out that our first version didn't work with CRMF. So we have added the ASN1 for both PKCS10 and CRMF with this uh, text that says, you must not use these extensions for X509 certificates. They are only for CRMF requests. Um, and this sort of ties into one of the security considerations that there's privacy implications with a CA just taking an attestation and moving it over into a certificate. You might have consented to share with the CA what model version patch level, blah, blah, blah of your HSM. Is it under dual control? Like you might have consented to share that with the CA, but you might not have consented for that to be in the certificate transparency logs. You can imagine you know, whoever's signing Firefox.exe might, might not want that information published publicly. So there's privacy implications with a CA just automatically moving that extension over, which is why this draft says don't do it. If you want to put attestations in certs, that's not this draft. You're going to have to write your own security consideration <laughs> section. <laughs> yeah. Next. Sure. Uh, the other change, this is just minor. We renamed certificate choice to certificate alternatives to avoid a name collision with 5652. And we struck out the opaque cert, which we don't think we have a use case for. Next. So here's an open design question, which um, I'll just sort of introduce, but then Hendrik is going to give a fuller presentation on later on in the agenda. Nonces and freshness. Typically in the RATS architecture with attestations, you want to assume that the an attestation is fresh. You sort of assume it's a challenge response protocol that the, the relying party says, hey, device, tell me about yourself. And here's a nonce to prove that it's fresh and you get back a signed object. And that sort of RATS sort of assumes that there's this freshnessy thingy. Um, CSRs really don't work that way. CSRs don't often don't want to be fresh. Often you want like, for example, Acme is designed to accommodate cases where the Acme client is in a different network zone from where the private key actually lives. So the CSR gets signed, moves out of, to a different network zone. You can then do the certificate enrollment, but you don't have a full network path back to the private key. So you can't do a full round trip challenge response. Um, so CSRs need to work in that sort of environment. It's also common, uh, hideously, horribly so, but it's common for clients to reuse CSRs sometimes across multiple years. It's in someone's TXT file and they just keep pasting it into a website whenever they need a new cert. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm saying it's done and we need to not break it. So there's this sort of weird philosophical conflict between rats wants attestations to have freshness nonces, but CSRs don't. 
Um, so we've written up a big pile of security and implementation considerations around freshness that's in the draft. And I hope we've sort of done that hand waving properly. Uh, we basically just say that's out of scope for this document. If you want to handle freshness and you want the CSRs to contain nonces, you've got to somehow bind that to a protocol level nots. Um, and Hendrik and Hannes are going to present how to do that in EST and CMP. And that will come later. So is that tied closely enough to this that we ought to juggle the uh, agenda to put that next? The non the nonce the non C O P E S T doc. While, while I've prepped people's brains to receive Yes, it. exactly. You might as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm pretty sure I have slides from you already or from Hannes or whoever. Okay. I think that I think my last slide is just an adopt question mark or something or yeah, there we go. We're in Glasgow, probably not quite yet, but we're getting close. Good. All right. Any questions from Mike? Other than how's that nonce thing work? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a far way from over there. So <laughs> hi. Hi um, Hank. Yeah. You're, you're here. I, did you arrive today? Oh. Hi, this is Hank. <laughs> um, there, oh, there's, oh, this is loud. Um, there's some um, freshness is not recentness. And, and there are multiple ways to do freshness and evidence. So uh, it's, uh, a CA or RA might expect other uh, proofs of freshness than, than nonces. And, and these are possible and they could be just be noted in some consideration of security or some other aspect. I think it's just a, a paragraph on, well, if you have a trusted timestamp in there or your trust zone have some epoch ticks and uh, you understand what those are, go ahead. No problem, the nonce problem, you can even stone them in trees forever, not an issue. So we have like five paragraphs in there addressing nonces and freshness. If, if you have specific feedback on those paragraphs, of course we could. Yeah, yeah, but I, I was not aware that the, uh, that the nonce, is the, I thought it was a prominent example, but there are of course way more feasible ways to do, do freshness without recentness and, and then so that could just be a level. That's maybe a link to another document that says that. I know you know how to do PRs. You've done some on this. Feel free to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. We're going to go to that notch document then. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, Hank, are you still in the queue? <laughs> Before, based on your title slide? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so um, Hannes and I discussed uh, this topic of requirement of freshness of evidence, evidences in attestation cases and we said, okay, if you need something like that, then you need an enrollment protocol to provide you the, the nonce in advance um, to providing the CSR. And this is mainly what we um, wrote down. Next slide, please. So finally, it is the simple case. Uh, the RA provides or, or gets a fresh um, a nonce from the verifier, provides it in a message to the end entity, which then um, takes this nonce uh, to, to get the, the evidence from the attester, provide this evidence into the CSR, um, like um, Mike already presented, and provide it back. And then um, the verifier can, can check that the, the evidence is, is current. Next slide, please. Can you... Um say how this matches the really uh, on a separate network case? Where, where in this diagram is that network separation? Because the subject is not on here. CMP doesn't really work in our network. Right. And that's why I was asking. What you were just describing 
was an air gap network and CMP doesn't support that. So that's a different, uh, yet another problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Unrelated, I think. Okay. Thank you. Like when I was talking about air gap networks, I was thinking of like, um, you're pasting a CSR into a web browser. That's nowhere near where your server is. Those sorts of things. Okay. Yeah, but if you have an air gap network, um, SCMP has self-contained signed messages. You could even ship them right. by some other mechanism. Yeah. Thumb drive or whatever. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so I guess the point is, if you're doing CMP, you assume there is some way to do round trips to the subscriber private key. Yes. Whether that involves a USB stick and a truck, fine, but you, you already need a round trip, so you're not having a knots doesn't force an extra round trip. You already need one. Right. That's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> okay. So these are the, the examples um, we picked for CMP and EST. So both um, protocols uh, provide a, a message exchange for providing CSR attributes or certificate templates, as we call it in, in CMP. We could add an extension to this template providing the nonce and telling the end entity that an evidence is requested in the CSR, which then the, the, the end entity could provide in the, in the response. So in CMP, this is described in um, RSC 489, 9480 and 9483, which are just recently published. In EST, there are different mechanisms <laughs> described in 7030. There is a mechanism and there is another mechanism specified in 8295. And um, Michael wanted to present um, another mechanism in its, his draft on CSR attributes. So yeah, we, we are not yet quite sure which one is the most appropriate one or whether it's transparent and can be used with any of those. Uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, I think uh, section 452 of uh, EST is not very appropriate because if you would create state at each invocation of the CSR at endpoint, and that doesn't, you know, you probably want a separate uh, API endpoint to actually get a non so that you have an explicit signal from the client that really wants to use that interface in order to get a nonce to get the nonce rather than you know making it bundle it with other generic stuff. Yeah, so if the end entity requests um, attributes uh, to be covered in the CSR and the RA thinks that an evidence, uh, an attestation evidence is required, including a freshness nonce, why not using that? Um, endpoint. Because how can the array make the decision without an explicit signal from the client? Is it, is it not the end entity that no, wants it could to be a policy, a policy decision? decision? Yes. Of the array. Okay. So the array would do that for every single invocation of that. Uh, for every interface. invocation that wanted that extension, for example. Exactly. Okay. So then it's not a static template which can be reused for any request from any arbitrary entity, but uh, the RA has to Dynamic craft and a new, uh, or fill a new nonce into the mm -hmm. template for each request. Mm -hmm. So going back to what Hank, Hank was saying before, uh, you have many different ways to do mm -hmm. freshness in rats. And one of them is the epoch marker, which allows you to reuse a nonce across you know, a period of time. So maybe that's okay. a, an optimization that you could consider yeah. here. Of, of course. Right. So your, any feedback is welcome, of course. Um, this was just a first um, draft introducing or explaining how using an enrollment protocol this could be provided. Yeah, if you, this this mm -hmm. consideration comes from my experience. In the, at the Akaton, we, we, did, we did some prototyping on this, exactly this bit. So. Okay. And the problem was you know, creating state without really on the verifier as well, because you need to get these, the verification session on the verifier associated with that nonce and then the verifier to remember that. So it was a bit you know, <laughs> clumsy. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is it. 
Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, OCSP is up next. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, change since I did from 17, uh, we were was adopted. And we address some comment by Russ and Rob. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We, we have some change, like switch address, some comment from Russ and Rob, and their change. Uh, next, please. In 117, we had uh, a lot of discussion, I think, but like, there was no opposition comment on the last call, like adoption call. And, we are, and we are just making some change in protocol, uh, no, profile. We are no, not changing protocol and our change of profile is inside of the scope of the protocol. So there isn't that much controversial change. So I think we are ready for Wajira score. Yep, that's all. Anyone have any concerns with going to working group last call in the next couple of weeks? Sean, there's no missing dot, dot, dot somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. All right, yeah, thank you. All right, so next we have Sean, who now has uploaded Kyber slides. And, and I have to get out of this for them to find it. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's just one slide, so it won't take that long. Mm -hmm. So we have this Kyber search draft, which is how you're going to put uh, Kyber keys in a certificate. <coughs> it is, huh? It is there, huh? Did it reload? <coughs> what I was thinking, but it's not. There it is. No, that's chair slides. So if I uh... Okay, let me hit reload, see what happens. There they are. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, <clears throat> import the stack. Right, get out of here. Get out of here. Share preload slides. There. There. Okay, so I learned a lesson last time no dark slides, so always lighter slides from now on. Mm -hmm. um, so, hey, we had this Kyber search draft. Uh, NIST is going to publish a document, and they changed the name of the algorithm. So we're going to have to address that somehow. So that's my cute little way of doing it. Next. Um, O2 was just to keep a live draft. It expired. So basically, we just you know, updated the dates and went with it. So in O3, we're going to try to change the name. And I was right about to hit the button to do all this stuff. And then Boz is like, oh, hey, that example that I've so nicely generated for you, that's not going to be the latest thing. That's the old previous version. So I got kind of in this chicken and egg problems. Should um, we merge the, the example certificates into the draft and not change the name or put do the name change and leave the example out? So I'm curious what the working group would prefer. All in one. All in one. <laughs> so the problem is that if I put it, what do you mean, what do you mean by all by all in one? Okay, because then we just have to put them, and we just put a note in there say like, hey, this is the old. Okay, all right, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. And then the last thing that we're gonna have to argue about in any way discuss is like, what's the private key format? And so I'm hoping some smart people can wade into the discussion and tell me what the, maybe the minimum is that we need. 
because again, the, the, this decision is like, you can put it all in, which is really good for some implementations, but for small implementations that are like memory constrained, it's better for them to not have all of the fields, but then that takes more energy when they need to like reconstitute the thing. So hopefully some people that know more about the particular format can help me. So, all right, I know what to do for O3. We will do that with a big warning and put an example in there. And then Sean, for do you 04, remember that document from IBM and a bunch of other- Yeah, but it had like 1200 OIDs in it, yeah. Yeah, that yeah, one. That one. But how many formats for Kyber keys did it have? I don't remember. I just remember. Because if the answer is one, yeah. then go grab it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yes, I will, go, I will definitely go look at that IBM document and see what's there. But I think that was a, here are the litany of things you can do and we should try to figure out what's- Right, no, if they had 12, that's a different- Yeah, it's a different story. All right, cool, great. Thank you very much. That's it. Expect an O3 in the next couple of weeks. Ciao. Yeah. Ciao. More people. Oh, I was going to run away. I was just going to mention in our hackathon, we do have some people that have actually created Kyber certificates. So, yeah, I want to look at those. I think we're using just octet strings with a private key format. Gee. I mean, very basic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's. <laughs> and ultimately... we had discussions about this, like you know, in our first hackathon, but what private key formats and people all converged on that, and it just works. And, and if that's the case, then that's great. Because I mean, the one of the one of the concerns, obviously, is that like you can go wild. And I don't want to go wild. I mean, Ace and one yes. could do lots of great things, I know but there like were that's not multiple helpful. Multiple drafts, I think, yeah. that had different formats, and yeah. they all had to decide. The code. There were two. One was big and complicated. One was octet string. Octet string works, and okay. it just makes doing implementations works is a for good other things. things. Yeah. <laughs> right, and we've we've done some interop with that too as well. All right, cool. We'll keep that in mind when we kick that discussion off. I'll try to keep it in a separate thread so we can time box it. Because at the end of the day, I'm not so sure how much of an interoperability thing it is. And so if it ends up being a sword, a hill on which people are willing to die on a bunch of swords, I'm taking it out of the draft. Uh, <laughs> Daniel Con Gilmore, sorry, I forgot to put myself in the queue. Um, in OpenPGP, we're moving in that direction as well. Like the, there's like a fancy way to split out all of the little pieces of the cryptographic stuff. Octet string, it's, it's it's string. Like, yeah. I feel it's like foot guns, right? Like, yeah. and, you, and we often pull those triggers, so it's not. Okay, <laughs> great. Let's stop pulling those yes. triggers. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is that the end of the P Kicks chapter? <laughs> yes. yes. All right. Then we're going to move to the S Mime chapter, but. Header protection, the people aren't all in the room. Right. <laughs> uh, Alexi's not here. Yeah. He asked to, that that be on Wednesday. So it'll be Kyber CMS, right? Yes. I thought I saw that. Julian sent some stuff. Okay, I'm not seeing it. Why not? CMS Kyber, there it is. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Julien Pratt from CryptoNext. Um, so I will uh, tell you about the changes uh, on the RFC, RFC uh, CMS, uh, Kyber within CMS uh, since version zero. So next slide, please. Uh, so the changes uh, are mainly editorial. Uh, so I added references to um, the new uh, draft RSCs that, that has been uh, that have been published uh, since uh, last version, especially the the CAM recipient info uh, draft RSC, the Kyber certificates RSC, and uh, the CMS SHA free uh, RSC. Um, so in CMS, uh, we give some details about the content, uh, a, a specific instantiation of the. Uh, came recipient info for uh, usage with uh, Kyber. 
And uh, in the end, the last change uh, is about the different algorithm, algorithmic configurations that uh, we want to use uh, with Kyber. Uh, so here we give uh, some uh, algorithm uh, combinations to be used for KM, KDF, and uh, wrap uh, functions uh, to, um, to try to have a consistent security level between algorithms. Um, so yeah, that's it for the changes. Uh, next slide, please. And for the next steps uh, of this uh, draft RFC, uh, so the first open point uh, well, was almost addressed uh, by uh, Sean uh, during uh, last presentation. Should we turn the, the, the document into uh, MLKM, use of MLKM in uh, CMS? So if you have a view on that, uh, please let me know. And uh, for the next steps, uh, so we have four uh, OIDs to be defined. Uh, and the ISN1 module to be updated and the test vectors to be added. Maybe in the next hackathon uh, will be the opportunity to produce some test vectors. That's it. Uh, Scott Fleur, Cisco Systems. I just have one minor note. You list uh, the key, uh, uh, the uh, encryption for the middle uh, level, layer three, level three to be AES 192. Uh, that is a very lightly used and lightly implemented uh, version. I suggest going to AES 256 at that point. At that point? Okay. Yes. Even though it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's quote, more secure than you need and everything else, but who cares? Okay. Mm -hmm. Why not? So, yeah, why not? <laughs> yes, John Gray. Um, I agree with uh, Scott's point. I was going to say you had the question about making the name of it to ML Chem. I, I think you should just because everything's moving to ML Chem. So, and that's going to be the next name. So, let's do it. Okay, so and what about uh, keeping both Kyber and MLChem uh, in the? Well, I think I think the name is going to be MLChem, right? That's what NIST is yep. calling it. Okay. So just if there are any existing MLChem. implementation, mm -hmm. so we can just get rid of it and. I think so. Okay. That or or MLChem dur during development, known as Kyber. You know, the first time you reference it and leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then we should change the title as well. Okay. Yes, but don't change the draft name. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what Sean's doing as well. In his next version, he's going to change Kyber to MLChem. Okay, and maybe just one other question uh, about the algorithm configurations. Um, so where should it be uh, agreed? Because many protocols and many uh, algorithm combinations are needed. Uh, and maybe... Uh, a working group should decide the, 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 the combinations that should be used uh, for uh, appropriate security levels. Maybe. So do you have an opinion on this? Which group should uh, give an opinion on that? Is it Bequip or? Not hearing anybody in the room has thought about that. That's surprising. <laughs> I would just propose some and people will argue if they see something in there they don't like. <laughs> okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So I will take that. Um, yeah, I and mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of this alignment that needs to happen across working groups, right? Like looking at like Scott's comment should it be AES 192 or two. I think among the authors of all the different documents here i think we all know each other and we're talking enough that we can make sure we get all that aligned does it need to be here does it need to be pqip can it be private discussions we we did say that pqip would be the place to make sure we were all talking so that cose jose cms pqix uh, and so on all come out using um algorithms that one library can support all the protocols right uh, that's the goal Okay. Okay. Thanks. And also, and also the shared analysis. Like, 
Sure. <laughs> you know, the, the, the debates of what actually security levels align across the Cypher suites that should be consistent. Mm -hmm. There is no updates for Sphinx Plus. Um, we're just waiting for the OIDs. Yeah, Sean. Did we have slides for that? Sean, did you send any slides for 59.90? Okay, you got anything to say? Okay, well that document's in working group last call right now. Please review it. Please make sure that uh, any concerns you have are heard. Five minutes, should we go with composite? <laughs> <laughs> it's composite cam. Yeah, we could do it. Mm, no. I, DKG, five minutes enough for you for end end guidance? I did want that. Um, well, no, he, said, he explicitly asked header protection. Okay, well, that's one slide. They are completely. Oh, uh, okay. then I'll wait. Then I would like to look. Yep. Yeah. All right. Let's let's in five minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, and if it gets me too uh, contentious, then I'll try to put you on the second. Then session. you'll end up talking on Wednesday. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but while you're all here. <laughs> Uh, right, so next slide, please. Uh, so we have the situation where uh, Alice is send, uh, Carol is sending mail to Alice and Bob. There's a key for Alice, there's no key for Bob. Carol has four options. Send an encrypted message to both, Bob can't read it. Send it in the clear to both. They can both read it, but Alice is getting a clear text copy when she could have gotten an encrypted one. Send it encrypted to Alice and just drop Bob. Well, Al Carol might not want to do that. Or option four, send an encrypted copy to Alice and a clear text copy to Bob. Some folks say, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. Uh, that's one option. But other folks will say, well, we want to do it anyway. And so if someone does it anyway, how, does, how do we deal with that? What is the outcome? Next slide, please. This is a little picture. Uh, the message, the same message being sent to two people. One copy is in the clear, one copy is encrypted. Next slide, please. Oh, the suspense. OK, so this is the problem statement. When you get an encrypted message, um, you want to show it to the user. You want to tell the user, was this message encrypted or not? The message that was received by Alice, who does have a key, was encrypted. But should she know that it wasn't encrypted when another copy went out? Um, and when Alice says, reply all, and she can't find a key for Bob, her mail user agent might not have the same policy. It might not say, well, I can just send encrypted to one side and then clear text to the other. So, what should her user agent do? How is she going to know that this is a different kind of a thing? Next slide, please. Um, so we talked about this at IETF 116 and SEC Dispatch. It was marked as AD follow-up. We talked about it briefly on the list in April. Uh, there were some people on the list who agreed that this could be done in LAMPS. Um, this is mentioned uh, in end-to-end -end mail guidance that prefers options two and three, not option four. But if people are going to do four, we need to know what to do with it because uh, we don't control the other people's clients. Um, and this is related to some of the future work that is in the end-to-end -end, uh, mail guidance. Next slide, please. So the design space lets you choose a lot of different things. You could think about how to signal. The draft as it currently stands says we could go with the message header. Do you signal in detail and say if there was clear text copy to these folks and encrypted to these folks, or do you just have a Boolean, whether it was encrypted to everybody or not? The current draft says go for a Boolean. Um, and then what do you do when you get a message that has no signal? What do you, how do you treat an encrypted message that doesn't have this whatever signal that there is? Next slide, please. So uh, the draft was recently updated, recently meaning yesterday. Um, Daniel Huygens from Proton uh, added himself to the authors, which is great. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and actually contributed the specific text that made these decisions and said, this is a concrete proposal. We think this is a reasonable thing to go forward with. Um, so it's now not just a problem statement draft, it's a potential solution, and we need more feedback from the list. Um, it focuses specifically on the visible recipients of the message. So if you BCC, you don't have to, you don't have to make a different decision. Um, 
so uh, one open question that's not yet left in the draft is about the default. There's some text in there about if the thing is widely deployed, I think it could probably use a little bit more consideration um, about how we deal with that. I, we'd love to hear feedback from the group. Next slide. Wait a minute, I want to probe on that a second. Yeah. The Sorry, current I'm going to the SVIME I know. The current SVIME spec says um, BCCs receive a separate submission. Right. Right. And how does that play with this header? In a separate submission, you would. So for the messages, for the, the submission that's going to the non bcc folks, you don't care. Right. You don't mention the separate submission. For the message that's going to the BCC uh, folks. Because uh, they can still hit reply all. They can hit reply all. <laughs> they would get the same header that you put in the, in the, um, in the encrypt in the in the main copy in the in the copy to the visible recipients, I think, but it doesn't say that explicitly. Uh, <laughs> please please suggest text. We'll put it in. All right. Thank you. Um, so what we're asking for the working group is, can we formally adopt this here in the working group? I know there's not really enough stuff happening in lamps, so I thought we would <laughs> add an extra draft. Um, both uh, of the Daniels are willing to serve as editors if folks want us there, and I think we're willing to give up change control to the working group. Daniel, tell me if that's wrong. Um, and what we really want is we want people who think about mail user agents and mail user agent experience to weigh in on this. You could also weigh in and say, this is all a terrible idea. There's a better approach or these are the wrong decisions to do. Happy to hear that too. But we want is we want people who work on mail user agents to think about this because if we can get this to work, we're going to want your mail user agent to do this thing. Even if you never send out um, clear text copies, we're going to want you to send the, a little note in the message that said, this did not have a clear text copy so that uh, recipients can make sense of it. So that's the pitch. We hope y'all will consider it for adoption. There's already been talk on the list that people saying, yes, we think we could adopt it. That was in April. It's now November. Um, I don't know what we need to do. Chairs. Does anyone object to a uh, working group call for adoption in the next few weeks? OK. Would you Note taker, please make that an action item. Thank, Thank you. you. Five minutes. And, yeah. and it worked. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you on Wednesday. Part two. <laughs>